uh, my talk today uh, will be about extending the limits for liver transplantation and how would this affect the uh, liver transplant uh, outcomes. So uh, despite improvements in donor and recipient selection in liver transplantation, there is a persistent disparity between organ supply and demand. And I'm sure uh, most of the audience uh, frequently encounter the not so pleasant uh, scenario of having a patient who is indicated for liver transplantation. However, uh, the procedure or the idea becomes deferred due to lack of a suitable donor. Uh, so uh, this problem has resulted in increased efforts over the past two de decades to uh, expand the, both the donor and the recipient pools uh, in order to meet the uh, unmet needs of the population through extended criteria organs and alternative avenues for marginal liver use. And this is even more challenging when coupled with the ever-growing recipient pool and the aging populations. So in order to tackle um, this um, problem, uh, we have uh, two uh, um, uh, strategies. The first strategy is to expand the donor pool, and the second one is to uh, try to uh, extend the criteria or the acceptable criteria for uh, recipients. So when we look at uh, the expansion of the uh, donor pool, uh, the extended criteria donor, donor liver allografts or the marginal donors are defined as donors which do not meet the traditional criteria for organ donation. With a careful donor selection, in fact, and recipient matching, these livers may help bridge the gap between supply and demand. So um, uh, if we quickly revise uh, what uh, are, are the uh, uh, criteria for acceptable donors in most uh, centers, we will find that th these criteria include age uh, between 18 and 50 years, ABO uh, compatible blood group, and uh, the presence uh, or the absence of comorbidities, or it may be extended to accepting a single comorbidity such as controlled hypertension, a liver attenuation index of more than plus six, and a BMI of less than 25, a GRWR more than 0.8, and a remnant a liver volume, volume of more than 30% of the TLV and uh, an anatomically suitable donor for donation. Um, several factors such as uh, the uh, aging population, the longer life expectancy rates, and the rising incidence of several metabolic conditions such as obesity, diabetes, and fatty liver disease uh, are all important contributing factors to uh, the um, uh, ever uh, uh, expanding problem of uh, the poor donor quality. So such issues are projected to in fact decrease the donor liver utilization rate from 78 to 44% if extended criteria donation are not included in the pool. And while these organs were previously avoided due to our fear of a primary non-function, delayed graft function, they are now increasingly used with compelling evidence that they, in fact, exhibit recipient outcomes comparable to the standard liver donations. So um, we don't have any uh, universally accepted definition of what constitutes an extended criteria uh, for donation. However, um, the, for the sake of uh, the shortage of time, I'm going to uh, come across uh, 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 in this lecture the frequent, frequently, most frequently cited characteristics, uh, which are the advanced donor age, hepatic steatosis, and donors with infectious risk or previous malignancy, and ABO um, incompatible donors. Uh, the last two points, which are spit liver transplantation and donation after cardiac death, are um, specific for cadaveric liver transplantation, so they are outside the scope of our lecture today. So uh, the first uh, factor, which is, uh, uh, or the first strategy, could be accepting donors with an advanced age. Uh, so um, the use of liver, livers from older donors is now becoming more frequent in the modern practice, and we don't... Uh, actually have a clear cutoff uh, uh, for the age uh, uh, that uh, constitutes uh, an appropriate donor, but several transplant units are currently expanding what is considered an acceptable donor age. Uh, in fact, in 2014, 8% um, uh, of the liver donors uh, were uh, in the US were above 65 years and older, and um, in 2018, in a recent uh, uh, data, the recent data supplied by the uh, Organ Procurement and Transplant Network, uh, they, it, it, it increased to 10% in 2018. Um, 
Another report from the European Liver uh, Transplant Registry uh, observed that 29% of the donors are currently older than 60 years and 11% were above 65 years. Several studies uh, looked into uh, the effect of um, using uh, donors with advanced age uh, over uh, or on the survival benefits and the outcome of liver transplantation. And perhaps the largest of those uh, trials were uh, a study that was uh, uh, conducted uh, or that looked into the data from uh, the UNOS uh, database uh, and it, in, in, it looked into 24,000 uh, audit liver transplant candidates. In this study, um, they uh, uh, compared between uh, recipients who accepted the offer of uh, uh, donors above 70 years compared to matched control groups who declined a similar offer. And those um, uh, donors were matched in terms of MELT score and um, the uh, uh, original uh, 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 liver problem. So uh, they, uh, in fact, observed that a significantly lower five-year cumulative mortality rate of 23% versus 41% was observed. And those patients who accepted the offer of um, uh, taking a donor more than 70 years showed a substantial long-term survival benefit. Now, looking into studies that uh, studied uh, specifically liver, uh, living donor liver transplantation here, we can see a study that looked into uh, and compared um, 35 living donors that were aged more than 50 years and another group, uh, a matched group in terms also of MELT score and uh, the primary diagnosis uh, who were younger donors in their 20. And in this study, they observed that there was no significant difference in the five-year survival rates between both groups. Uh, however, um, uh, they uh, concluded that the, the use of older donors or older uh, old age donors should be used with caution and should be weighed um, uh, and it, it should be uh, taking into consideration uh, the graft size and the hepatic the degree of hepatic steatosis, other factors. Now, the second strategy uh, for donors is the use of steatotic livers. And we all know that there's a rise in incidence of obesity and metabolic syndrome, and this has led to an exponential rise in the uh, incidence of uh, and the prevalence of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with the population prevalence reaching up to 30% in Western societies. And the ri those rising incidence and prevalence rates have uh, been uh, paralleled with increase in the potential donors with hepatic steatosis. And traditionally, the steatotic allografts were avoided in liver transplantation for the risk of posing significant challenges in terms of early graft dysfunction and primary non-function. However, uh, this uh, um, was the largest study um, that um, was conducted back in 2010 by uh, Spitzer and their colleagues. And in this study, uh, they revealed that the biopsy donor liver um, that uh, uh, had a microcytosis of a cutoff of 30% was associated with a lower one-year survival rate and increased graft loss. However, they were able to uh, identify or to determine that microvascular cytosis was not a risk factor for graft loss. Uh, ever since then, similar studies have also demonstrated unfavorable outcomes with the use of grafts with moderate and severe steatosis, and this was largely due to the increased susceptibility to ischemia reperfusion injuries. However, with an effort to further expand the donor pool, fatty livers are currently increasingly um, used by the trans for transplantation, and they in fact form a major component for uh, extended criteria donation. A few reports to date have shown acceptable outcomes uh, achieved with uh, uh, donors or livers uh, with steatosis greater than 30%, but this needs careful, uh, careful risk adjustment and uh, it also remains controversial. Uh, similar studies also assess the uh, suitability of steatotic livers, have also considered the use of moderate to severely steatotic allografts with somewhat acceptable post-transplant outcomes, but this I have to uh, uh, underline that it, it should be provided by low-risk donors. Um, a third strategy would be to consider donors with increased infectious risk. The use of donors with exposure to HPV and HCV uh, has been uh, more acceptable uh, in current times. Um, uh, although it was previously met with a strong, very strong objections due to the initial concerns re regarding introduction of aggressive um, strains to immunosuppressed recipients. 
In the context of uh, uh, HCV, there has been a, a major shift in the previous attitudes and a recent OPTN data reports an increase in the number of livers recovered from HCV positive donors and the number of waitlist candidates willing to accept these livers. So uh, when we consider uh, patients who, uh, uh, or donors with HCV positive, there are uh, two um, uh, options. Uh, and the first one is to uh, provide HCV uh, positive recipients with positive donors. Uh, and this has in fact demonstrated comparable outcomes to those receiving HCV negative livers. The second one is to uh, uh, provide HCV negative recipients with HCV positive donors in addition to the use of uh, directly uh, direct uh, antivirals uh, and uh, this has seen some promise in terms of long-term outcomes. Um, this is a, a, a recent study by Cotter and their colleagues which analyzed data from the 2008 to the 2018 reports uh, and it reports an increased three-year graft survival rate from 79 percent to 88 percent in patients with HCV negative uh, or recipients H who were HCV negative and who received HCV positive livers with DEAs. Um, another strategy would be the use of ABO incompatible donors. And in fact, several studies uh, have uh, reported that uh, um, this, uh, the use of ABO incompatible liver donors uh, would have uh, similar survival rates and uh, ra the rate of complications is also compatible to uh, the use of ABA ABO compatible donors. Uh, however, uh, several studies or and meta-analysis reported that um, this was uh, associated with a slightly increased risk of uh, specifically biliary uh, complications, post-operative biliary complications. Uh, therefore, it should also be used with caution. So um, this should be done in the presence of, uh, or with the use or, or the aid of immuno uh, uh, different immunological strategies. And these strategies include the use of uh, plasma phareses or total plasma exchange or spinectomy, uh, IVIG and um, uh, local graft infusion therapy, which is an older technique. And uh, um, last but not least, the use of rituximab. And uh, recent studies have shown that hyperacute rejection has not been reported in most studies since the introduction of the use of rituximab. So um, when we look at the second um, major strategy, which is expanding the recipient pool, similar to uh, donors, uh, the increased uh, life expectancy and advances in the care of chronic liver disease has seen an increase in the number of elderly patients uh, needing liver transplantation. And based on the OPTN 2018 annual data report, the volume of the waitlisted liver transplant recipients older than 65 uh, years has increased from 8.1% to 24.1% from 2002 to 2018. Um, the problem with elderly uh, liver transplant recipients is that they most commonly or, or frequently have a, a higher BMIs, more than 30, uh, other comorbidities such as hypertension, uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and those patients um, have a 50% increased risk of post-operative cardiovascular mortality at 12 months, and therefore they need additional scrutiny during the process of selection. Um, this um, uh, study has shown that patient and graft survival rates following liver transplant in elderly recipients were lower compared to young recipients, but the survival benefits, uh, the overall survival benefit gained from liver transplantation was significant. Uh, finally, uh, another uh, uh, strategy in order to expand the indications for liver transplantation is the uh, expansion of uh, the indications in the area of liver transplant oncology. And um, this includes um, expansion of criteria for hepatocellular carcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma, and liver metastasis. So while HCC and hyaluronic cholangiocarcinoma have become accepted indications for transplantation, tumor size and standardized MDT protocols are necessary to ensure optimal patient outcomes. As more studies are seeking currently to expand the oncological indications for liver transplantation, it is now becoming increasingly clear that the tumor biology and the response to therapy are key factors for optimal oncological outcomes. Current data evaluating liver transplant for expanded oncological indications include expanded criteria for HCC, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and liver-limited uh, metastatic colorectal cancers. 
So regarding expanding the limits for liver transplantation for HCC, we know that we have the Milan criteria and we also have the, uh, ex the expanded or the beyond Milan criteria. And those include the UCSF criteria, the up to seven criteria, Valencia criteria, and extended Toronto criteria among others. others. And we also have the strategy of downstaging and perhaps the most uh, commonly used criteria for downstaging is the UNOS DS criteria. And the use of this uh, UNOS DS criteria has showed a post-transplant survival uh, following three years in one US-based study of 79.1% for those meeting the criteria and downstage before liver transplantation as compared with 83.2% for those always within the Milan, which was not a significant difference. Um, there ha has also been uh, recent uh, efforts and studies in order to expand the criteria for patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma as well as patients with mixed hepatocholangiocarcinomas uh, uh, and mixed uh, HCC cholangiocarcinoma. And uh, finally, this is a summary of the uh, current uh, clinical trials. Um, that are uh, currently studying the uh, um, outcomes uh, uh, for uh, conducting liver transplantation for patients with liver-limited colorectal metastasis. And they are, in fact, showing um, promising overall survival rates. So finally, my take-home messages would be that the transplant community continues to evolve and active efforts are currently uh, uh, being made in order to expand both the donor and the recipient pools in, uh, are, are, and are in fact in constant motion. And that the pre-existing criteria for liver transplantation and recipient boundaries are continually challenged and expanded. And uh, perhaps the most important keywords that this should be coupled with the judicious matching and careful patient selection and excellent patient and graft survival results are an endless opportunity. Thank you so much.